That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. We have a big, gigantic week, and I'm also posting early because it's the 4th of July, and it's a national holiday, and so I had the day off from work, which is great, because there were a lot of books to get through, and I probably wouldn't have been able to start to like, I don't know, 9 o'clock if I, um, if I didn't uh, get the chance uh, to read early today, so that's nice. But yeah, we got, got a lot of stuff. Um, if you missed live because I'm so much earlier, I tried to send out as many notifications as I could on Twitter, uh, so I just suggest following me there, um, but I tried to give an update here for the live stuff, so hopefully you didn't miss it if you really, really wanted to be here. Anyway, who we got in the comments? We got Jake Carlson, he's saying, Ivan Reese's work for the upcoming Superman stuff in DC Nation today. Oh yeah, I got that. I, I got it just for the Joker cover because I loved it. Uh, Tari, Terry, why do I keep going with Tari? Uh, Terry says, Batman number 50 was an interesting development. That it was, and we will get there. But, really, I'm not going to waste any time tonight, folks. We got just so much to go over, so let's, let's go through the roster real quick. We'll be starting with Green Lanterns number 50. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, number one. Batman number 50. Catwoman number one, Captain America number one, The Man of Steel number six, Doctor Strange number three, Cosmic Ghost Rider number one, and then for Trade Talk tonight we'll be talking about Wolverine Origin. So seriously, so very much to get through tonight, as you can well see. So let's go ahead and get right into it by starting off with Green Lanterns, number 50. Um, so I haven't really read Green Lantern in singles since the New 52 when Johns left. I was very disappointed by uh, a lot of what he did at the very end there, and I just didn't really have a lot of faith in it. Uh, so I've read a couple, like, mini-series and stuff, like the Star Trek Green Lanterns and the Planet of the Ape Green Lantern crossover. I liked those well enough. Uh, not so much Planet of the Apes. Um, but, you know, I was, I'd heard a lot of really interesting things about, uh, Green Lantern since Rebirth. Rebirth's been pretty good just all across the board, uh, and I'd kind of, after getting a taste of Jessica Cruz and Simon Baz as, like, a dynamic, eh, it was kind of interesting. And so, you know, new writer, new starting point, Dan Jurgens is on this book, and well, I've certainly given Dan Jurgens a lot of, um, a lot of guff for being, uh, so, so milking of his, his stories. Uh, I gotta say, this is a pretty so strong start. I uh, I didn't feel like he was really milking a really obvious reveal or anything, and it, it felt you know, pretty much like, like what I was expecting it to be, and and it definitely engaged me. As far as whether or not I'm going to continue on with this book, um, we'll see. I don't know, it's like, it's a good start. I'm not sure how many parts it'll be. I might pick up the first arc, uh, is, is kind of where I'm sitting here. I don't know if I'll stick with it beyond that. It'll depend on the quality of the first arc. But... I don't know, it was, it was fun, it was good. Uh, there's there's a mystery element here that kind of worked for me. Uh, Terry's in the comments and he's saying a uh, big spoiler for the whole book that I'll just go ahead and give away. Uh, yeah, we got another Dead Guardian uh, just when they got back um, in continuity. I didn't realize they'd been gone, gone, gone. Fair enough, yeah, that's kind of annoying. Uh, I don't know, the Guardians are so replaceable at this point, it doesn't really bother me. Um, but we start off this story with Jon Stewart investigating a uh, crashed, or a, a derelict spaceship, because you can't really crash a spaceship if you're in space still, um, when he's attacked by an armada, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be that big a deal, but then some super powered dude shows up and John tries to send a distress signal but the ring doesn't and in fact tells everyone that he's okay uh... 
catch a guy and kill a log dealing with a thing. And then Simon and Jessica and Kyle go into Oa for training. And then Guardian's wondering about what's going on with John. And then John fighting the guy again somewhere off in space. Uh, but his ring doesn't want to work, doesn't want to do what he's telling it to. Uh, and he keeps telling it to send an alert, and it's like, no, it doesn't want to do it, doesn't want to listen to him. Kyle, Simon, and Jessica arrive on Mogo. Uh, did I say Oa earlier? Because Oa's not a thing anymore uh, in continuity. That's going to be weird to get used to. They arrive on Mogo, and um, there's a storm, which is weird for Mogo, like hurricane-level storm, and it's tearing apart the buildings and yada yada yada. So there's just a lot of shit going wrong, basically. John, or, uh, Guy and Kilowog find Jon Stewart kind of drifting out in space, barely alive. Um, no one's really sure what's going on. Uh, and Jessica's ring is telling her not to trust anyone um, because Simon Baz is likely the one that murdered a guardian. One second, please. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on in this issue, a lot of things going wrong, which is, you know, it's generally exciting uh, to have stuff like that for me. That stuff really does work in, in its favor for me. Um, I really like and, and dig, you know, big epic mystery and and, you know, it's a murder mystery in space. It's got a lot going for it. The art's really good. Uh, so there's a lot here that I like. It's not really, you know, wowing me or anything. I'm not, like, in it um, 100%. It's not knocking anything out of the park for me. But it's like, yep, this is this is stuff that I enjoy. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can keep reading this. So, you know, fair issue. Um, we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, let's see here. Rando Brando has joined the the chat and says, We're all really here for Batman, right? You'll get there. You'll get there. Jay Carlson is, of course, here for me. Appreciate that. Um, Terry says, Like the more sci-fi feel to this issue and the malfunctioning ring with a rogue AI is a cool concept. Yeah, I do like that, too, that there's something wrong with the rings. And, I mean, that's hinted at very heavily on the cover. Uh Green Lantern's Evil's Might, it turns within the power battery, and you see, like, the the binary or circuitry of the power battery is yellow, and something's wrong with that. So, who knows? Who knows what will happen? I'll, I'll stick with that for the first arc, I think. Let's go ahead and move on to the book everyone's really waiting for, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, number one. I had no idea this was happening, published by Dynamite, uh... Of course. I mean, it's Elvira. She cracks me the hell up. Um, and this is written very much like uh, Elvira. It's it's very in character for her. Um, God, what's the what's the line that cracked me the hell up? Just sweet. Okay, okay. You weary yourselves for not my brides. I will catch you in the end. Catch me in the end? I don't even know where to buy lube in this century. God, that's... Oh, that's so Elvira writing right there. Just, just all over the place in this book. Cracking me the hell up. Ugh. You're like, oh, we'll close this door. That'll slow him down. Bust through the door. See, it slowed him down for a whole second. <laughs> uh, all the double entendres, all the all the dirty little jokes. Um, so it starts out with Elvira filming a cheesy horror movie where she's fighting Dracula, and they're on a first date, and she says, Slow down, Romeo. I like to start a first date with a steak dinner and then get hammered. Oh, that's that's cute. Um, but yeah, then she gets pulled into a vortex in a coffin, Ooh, doo, 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 doo. and when she crawls out of the other end, she encounters Lord Byron, uh, what's his name, Shelley, and 
the most famous of them all, Mary Shelley, in their castle estate as they search for a companion who is kidnapped by a monster man and blah blah blah, hilarity ensues. Um, Elvira jumps in the coffin that brought her there at the very end, and that takes her to a faraway land, uh, or another time, where she runs into Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan frickin' Poe. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is right up Elvira's alley. I'm sure she could turn that into a gag. Um, it's... It's cheesy as fuck, it's fun, it's TNA in the best possible way. This is the stuff where it's so in character and it just fits. Um, say, you're pretty good at this, you should be a writer. You are a flatterer. Who you calling flat? I like stuff like that quite a bit. Elvira always, always gets me. Uh, what's the one from the movie? Thunk, how's your head? Psh, haven't had any complaints yet. <laughs> and so it's it's really right in there. Uh, the art's pretty good. She's she looks like Elvira. There's you know intimidating characters and stuff. Um, it's all it's all silly fun and I'm just enjoying it. Um yeah. Yeah. I don't really have much else to say. I, I think this is fun. Uh I'm certainly going to be tempted to pick up the next issue, but this was an expensive ass week for me. I don't know if I can I can be committing to that every week for something that's like ah, ha, ha, that's that's fun especially at a four ninety nine price tag that or three ninety nine sorry price tag that's where it starts to get a little much you know uh I don't know it depends it'll depend on who she's gonna be crossing over with every week because Edgar Allan Poe does sound damn tempting if they're gonna keep up the the classic horror writers. You get some pretty cool stuff. Ugh. Alright. Let's go ahead and move on. Batman number 50. Yep, no pulse, because Tom King murdered me. Uh, this is the evidence, this is the murder weapon that Tom King used to violently rip out my heart and stomp on it on the ground. Um, I mean, the worst part is I, I knew it. I knew it was coming. Um, like, ah, Tom King. So, going all the way back to Rooftops the the two-part story he did with Gerard's um that was sad and and heartfelt but ultimately it was kind of the ultimate Batman Catwoman story where they they care about each other very much but they can't really be together properly because there's this inherent lack of trust and understanding and just a basic level of communication between the two of them uh, but then I started to think, hey, okay, he's, he's having Bruce think about changing. He's asking Catwoman to marry him. Maybe Tom King's going to commit to it. Maybe he's going to have Batman get in the relationship for the long haul. Mm. Ouch. It just hurt. It just hurt like hell. To see... 
the reason that the wedding doesn't work out. Um... And, I mean, it's it's been built since the very beginning. The idea that Batman can't be happy because then he can't be Batman. <sighs> we get all these pages of artists, you know, depicting... Batman and Catwoman's relationship over the years, all these ways that they've been portrayed, all the outfits they've worn, which again is something that Tom King's been playing with through his whole run. Um, the dates they've been on, as it were. And meanwhile, that's all put on the set dressing of letters that they're writing to each other. Uh, about what they're doing and why they they want this in Batman's case and why she can't do this in Catwoman's. So yeah, the big the big spoiler that's been spoiled since Sunday is that Catwoman doesn't show up at the altar. Uh and that she runs away because ahem. you were still a child Bruce a hurt child In these past months the desert the boy Superman Wonder Woman Ivy what you do with that hurt I saw the hero it made you and then as if to prove what I saw booster a world in hoarder b because you're content. Joker. Knowing if you were settled, you couldn't stop him. You're an engine that turns pain into hope. If we're happy, then we could be so happy. If I help that lonely boy with the lonely eyes, I kill that engine. I kill Batman. I kill the person who saves everyone. And how can I do that? How can I love you so much and look in your eyes? Into that endless blue, that gorgeous blue, that blue that calls me, knowing. To save the world, heroes make sacrifices. That's the lesson of every story. I wish I could give my life, but I can't. I have to give more. My sacrifice is my love. It's you. You know, so often it's Batman that does the the thing that's more than heroic. Uh, I go back to The Dark Knight, I guess, wherein Rachel and Alfred are having an argument about um, Bruce letting Harvey Dent sacrifice himself as, as coming out as really Batman. Um, Bruce letting Harvey Dent do that is not heroic. Well, now Alfred looks at her and says, No, it's not. It's something more. Heroes want to be remembered. Heroes want to be celebrated. Heroes have a selfishness to them. There's something beyond heroic when it comes to self-sacrifice. The idea that Selina Kyle knows that she can't let Batman be happy because then he can't be Batman is endlessly tragic horrifically fascinating and just ah it's just so sad <laughs> oh. man it's just so endlessly sad and then there's this turn at the end and people are discussing it in the comments and my mind is like what 
and at the same time, I fucking knew it! Ah, <laughs> oh, Tom King is an anglerfish of happiness and joy, and then just, like, waiting behind the little light of hope and, and, and contentment is this monstrous maw of depression and evil, and it's just, ah, oh, it's so fucked! <laughs> So yeah, Holly Robinson was broken out of Arkham to be Catwoman's uh, witness slash maid of honor. And then as Catwoman leaves Bruce at the altar, <sighs> Holly Robinson returns to Arkham to the bowels and sees from uh, left to right Riddler, Joker, Psycho Pirate, Bane, Gotham Girl, the Ventriloquist, Thomas Wayne Batman, and Doctor Strange. Okay, so let's... Let's break this down from the center. Okay. So, we are, uh, also, it's, it's worth noting Holly Robinson's in this room. Oh, and by the way, I don't think I've seen anyone point this out. That's Skeets. That's Skeets down there. Skeets is down there. So, there's, there's Skeets. Uh... So let's let's break this down. All right, Holly Robinson skeets. Okay, okay. So we got Riddler. Um, Riddler's there because he he assisted Bane, right? Riddler's there because he assisted Bane in getting into uh, Joker's cell in Arkham to fight Batman during I Am Bane. Joker's there because he helped break. Uh, Catwoman's resolve to marry Batman. He's a big part of, of why she stopped. Psycho Pirate's there because we'll get to him. Uh, Doctor Strange is there because he kind of helped set this whole shit in motion uh, back in, in the I Am Gotham arc by forcing Psycho Pirate to drive Gotham and Gotham Girl insane. Um, we got the ventriloquist and Scarface there because they were the only ones who could defeat Psycho Pirate by Batman's determination. We've got Thomas Wayne Batman there. And Thomas Wayne Batman played a very important role in King's run even though King didn't write him directly, though I do still suspect that he helped plot him back in, um, in the button. So Thomas Wayne Batman told Bruce not to be Batman because that's not what he wanted for him. He wants his son to be happy, not be Batman. The question, how is Skeets, or how is Thomas Wayne Batman there, probably makes a lot more sense now that I notice Skeets is there. Al alternate timelines and whatnot. Okay. Gotham Girl. Uh, so, quick uh, rundown of the early part of King's Run. Um, so we get I Am Gotham, where Gotham goes crazy uh, because of Psycho Pirate, Gotham Girl as well. Uh, goes on a murder spree, and ultimately Gotham Girl is forced to kill her brother. Uh, that breaks her mind even more, and she is just absolutely wrecked in a state of basical, basically catatonic state. Um, so Psycho Pirate's kind of responsible for all that under the instruction of Hugo Strange. Um, and then, of course, Bane bartered for Psycho Pirate because Psycho Pirate, using his ability to manipulate emotions and psyche, um can make Bane not addicted to Venom. Uh, so Batman got Catwoman and the Suicide Squad together to go get Psycho Pirate so he could help Gotham Girl. But during the I Am Bane story, Psycho Pirate was very, very creepily just barely reassuring in, in what he was supposed to do as, as far as, like, fix... Gotham Girl. Um, 
she was oof that's I've been waiting for the the shoe to drop on that one and this is a, a ah Tom King you bastard <laughs> why must you hurt me so <laughs> um so yeah psycho pirates there uh because he's kind of manipulating all this Holly Robinson's there because Apparently, she was an agent of Bane this whole time. And apparently, since the very fucking beginning of Batman breaking into Santa Prisca and kidnapping Psycho Pirate back, uh, this has all been part of Bane's plan to make Batman think he could be happy and then, to quote Bane, the bat is broken yeah yep 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 yeah yeah yep 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 yeah yeah yep 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 that'll do it okay so here's time for controversial opinion I fucking hate nightfall uh or not fucking hate uh I think nightfalls really in the same it's slightly better but it's really in the same category of as Superman Doomsday, Death of Superman, whatever you want to call it. Um, wherein, you know, like, it's a big deal that it happened, that Batman had his back broken by Bane, but really there's so much that just felt so fucking cheap about that. Like, I've held on to the opinion that Bane figuring out who Batman is has really no character justification. It's just there, so you can have an intimidating fight in the Batcave, and it doesn't really mean anything. Um, this, mm, this is Nightfall done right, where Bane th throws everything at Batman in order to just destroy him. <laughs> and it works question mark eyebrow raise I can't I raise this eyebrow there we go it's hard to see with the mirrored oh uh, just again I want to go back to Catwoman's letter um you are an engine that turns pain into hope does Bane know that Mm. Saw it coming, folks, but it doesn't hurt any less. I feel so sad for Batman in this. Oh my, how fucking sad can you get? You know, there's like this whole scene that Holly and Catwoman share. Um... Are there multiple scenes like you know getting that reveal and going back and reading Holly's lines you realize how in uh, Selena's head she is I can't believe that's him the Batman not what you thought it's insanity isn't it Selena you know we've known him from the beginning I just never I don't know I can't believe he's like this he's never been like this like what happy he always seemed to you know need his misery like it was how he did what he did what oh man what an issue what a heartbreaker There's also one moment in this that was very, very touching. Um, really did work for me, and it just, again, it just makes it even worse. Uh, as Alfred and Bruce are discussing who will be the witness on Bruce's side. As for this witness, uh, shall I 
Call Master Dick or perhaps Master Clock. No, no, I was just thinking it could be you, Alfred. If you're free. Since it's been the two of us since the beginning. I can't do anything without you. I never could. Or will. And just this look. Shannon kills it. Oh my god, it just got me so hard. That was such a special fucking moment, and it just... Mm. <sighs> Debating on how personal I want to get, but I'll just say... My dad died before I was married, and I remember being kind of melancholy on my wedding day and thinking about how I was really sad he couldn't be there and it just uh, the parts of that got brought up for me again <sighs> wow yeah this issue was absolutely incredible on the story uh, art again Janin kills it with a lot of facial expressions a lot of pathos uh and just a great job visualizing um, the the emotions felt here. Uh, I love this this page of Catwoman as she finally decides to run away. <laughs> Absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, the the look on Bruce's face as he realizes what's happened all over again. Um, those are great. And then, of course, we have all the guest artists on here. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, every single page is a poster of Batman and Catwoman. Every single one is a full-size print. Um, you could honestly do a reprint of just Batman number 50 on poster scale paper um just you know I'm gonna go grab one <laughs> I would read uh, the entire issue at this scale every fucking page of it just to marvel at the level of detail put into this thing. Stunning, jaw-dropping, gorgeous. Let me see here, if I move this right over here. Oh, shit, this frame sucks. Ah. Sorry, I don't want a glass breaking in the middle of my show. <laughs> um, yeah, I would read the whole fucking book in that scale. Uh. So yeah, we get uh, Garcia Lopez, right off the bat, um, I'm just gonna kinda go through these, and, like, what I like about the narrative advice is these pages epitomize not only the emotion of the scene, but also the emotion of, um, the way that the, the characters interact with each other, um, the, the content of the relationship. And so the, the whole structure of the book goes um, normal page, two pages of full page uh, abstract images that are connected, and the work on those is narration of the letters that they're each writing to each other. And then we go back to normal page of story and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, we get some absolutely gorgeous stuff. Fabak kills it. Miller. Oh my god. Frank Miller drawing Batman again is just trippy as fuck in a weird way. Ugh. Bermejo. I really love. I love when Bermejo draws Batman. Um. It's just so cool. That's a great one. Neil Adams is back. 
I mean, wow, Neil Adams with Hi-Fi. That's craziness. Tony Daniel with the two of them on a motorcycle is super cute. Um, Connor. Connor who? Sorry, I'm not like super aware of who every single artist in the world is because we got apparently all of them on the same book. Amanda Connor. Okay. I do love this image of Amanda Connor of, of just that she did of, of the two of them on a date in the zoo having a picnic with the tigers. That's crazy. I like it. That seems like the kind of date Catwoman would take you on. Um, Albuquerque and Andy Kubert. See, it's so weird that Neil Adams didn't do this one because that feels like the one that they would have contacted him for. Um, but it works. It works. Uh, Andy Kubert's art's really cool. Hmm. I thought it was interesting that Sale and Pope actually broke theirs down into panels. Um, so it makes it stick out in an interesting way compared to the format of the rest of the book. Gerard's. Clay Mann. Hmm. Templeton. Templeton's probably the one that didn't work very well for me. Uh, Ty Templeton. Hmm. I really like Joel Jones's though. It's interesting that she's doing, you know, just an extension of her scene. Um. And then Finch repeating the cover uh, that he did for their proposal issue, as well as. Uh, Jim Lee. I mean, that harkens back to Hush in a big way, doesn't it? Which, again, a lot of this has felt like Hush done right. Um, Capullo, and then Lee Weeks. Lee Weeks does have a nice minimalist feel to it, not gonna lie, but I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, single issue. Absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, Tom King is just never allowed to quit writing Batman uh, until he makes this up to me and he'll never be able to do it because I'm a dead man. This is my ghost. Thank you. <sighs> mm. Let's go ahead and move on uh, to Catwoman number one, written and drawn by Joelle Jones with art by uh, Laura Allred, or not art, with coloring by Laura Allred. Um, oh man, I didn't realize how badly my cover was. Damn it! Oh well, it's on, it's on the back. Um, so I was really curious if Joelle Jones knew how to write. She does. I still am not, like, super into it. Uh, it's it's not a matter of, like, I don't like Catwoman, because I do, but yeah, she's definitely not my character. It's not a matter of Joel Jones doesn't know what she's doing, because she definitely does. There are great scenes in here, uh, and the, the premise is really cool for where this is going. Uh, there's, there's some interesting commentary going on here. There is one scene that... Oh, I read this right after Batman, and it, it still broke my heart. Um, she gets a package in the mail, and she opens it, and it's her Catwoman costume, and it's Alfred returning it, and we just get these three panels at the bottom of this page. Oof. Oof. Ouch. Ah. Uh. Ouch. It just hurts, man. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of great emotion and, and su such conveyed in this. There's a cool air of mystery. There's an absolutely fucking unnerving villain, uh, who we just, 
You remember Skyfall? Uh, when fucking what's his name in Skyfall? Uh, like breaks down and like removes the insert from his mouth, and like his whole face collapses. So here's their villain. The blonde lady. Here's her. When she's taken off all her makeup and prosthetics. That's creepy as fuck. Um, you immediately get a sense of vainness. Uh... Especially the way she's talking, because she's like, apparently the, uh, the wife of a governor, um, but she's got such a vanity to her, where they're talking about, uh, shall I have your suit pressed? That's fine, only let's do the black pumps this time. Be a lamb and send in my sons, won't you? Um, and, and she says that, you know, looking like that, there's definitely a vanity, uh, that you could accuse Catwoman of having. Um, there's an interesting, uh, current here of women uh, standing in women's way, women standing in their own way, in, in the way of other women, you know what I'm trying to say, uh, wherein Catwoman figures out that someone's impersonating her and so goes to, uh, confront them and beat the shit out of them. Uh, and, like, she's being kind of coy. Nice outfit. Too bad for you. It looks better on me. Fucking gets elbowed in the chin. You wish, you old bitch. <laughs> Catwoman's just old. Um, so, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's really interesting. There's a definite sense of, oh, shit, uh... There's a definite sense of, of rivalry amongst women in here that is intriguing. Uh, and I'm definitely... I definitely enjoyed it. I don't know, I got a lot of books on my plate right now. And while I liked it, it didn't blow me away. That's kind of what I'm coming down to on it. And so... I don't really need more Catwoman in my life. Especially because I'm really mad at her right now, <laughs> thanks to Tom King. Um, mm. What can I do? What can I tell you? That's just kind of where I'm at on it. So I don't think I'll be picking this up. Unless, of course, comments start, like, you know, just raging at me to pick it up. Alright. Let's go ahead and move along. To Captain America, number one, written by Tanahisi Coates, uh, with art by, what's the name of the artist again? I had it and I lost it. Uh, Lenil, Lionel? Lionel? I think that's Lionel. Lionel Francis Yu? Um, okay, so this is interesting. <laughs> because... Nick Spencer fucked things up for Captain America for quite a while. Um, he really he really screwed that whole continuity up for a bit. And so Mark Wade's approach, Mark Wade was brought in to just be a fucking palate cleanser and just make you forget kind of for a while about Spencer's run. Um, Coates doesn't seem to be doing that. Matter of fact, you could have read Spencer's run all the way through Secret Empire's awful garbage to its conclusion. Stopped reading Captain America for a couple months because it left such a bad taste in your mouth. And then start picking it up at Captain America number one thinking, okay, fresh start time, let's, let's do this. And it's, it's picking up. Directly as a sequel to Secret Empire. Um, like, certainly, certainly Wade's run for an issue or two dealt with some of the fallout of Secret Empire and the fact that people won't trust uh, Cap anymore, yada yada. 
Um, this is that's what this whole premise is is the fallout of what Nick Spencer left in his wake but good um that's the thing like like it's it's definitely problematic that we have to deal with this continuity but there there are two ways to deal with something in comic books as far as continuity and picking up after a really bad story goes uh you can either say, okay, fuck that noise, it was an evil twin, and no one's gonna ever talk about this again. Or, you can pick it up and run with it, and make it work in spite of itself. I'm not going to say that Coates is setting out to try and save Spencer's run and redeem it. What I am going to say is Coates is trying to pick up the pieces of what did actually work about Spencer's run in the early day days of it and and what message lied underneath that while good was handled horrendously. I think Coates is going to try to run with those things, make that aspect of it work but give us a true Captain America book. Um, tis my theory. How well will he do this? Based on this first issue and the preview with the last one, reasonably well. He seems to know what he's doing here. Um, like, I did not like Coates' Black Panther because... The commentary associated with Black Panther is at odds with the myth and the power of Black Panther. The commentary in this is very much in line with what kind of thoughts we should have when it comes to the, the power and myth of Captain America. Ahem. <laughs> These men brought terror to the capital of the free world, but they also found me, a soldier at home or away, a man loyal to nothing except the dream. As Cap starts to fight these guys who are basically American terrorists. Um, what's the line at the beginning? And it really worked. There's the story they tell... And then there's the story the papers tell. The people rose up and destroyed Hydra. But I've been at war since I was a boy. These things don't just end. Somehow, the front always comes back home. That's where I come in. These men brought terror to the capital of the free world, but they also found me. A soldier at home or away, a man loyal to nothing, except the dream. Let's talk about American exceptionalism. All right. The way these conversations usually go is there is a desperate attempt to acknowledge and make note of the wrongs of America's history, but in spite of that, to try to focus on the rights in order to highlight the pride that one should feel in the nation, that one does feel in the nation. I mean, everyone gets a little teary-eyed when you play I'm Proud to be an American, right? And that's how that kind of conversation usually goes. Or 
you get the more hard that that's the liberal side of it. You get the more hardline conservative view of nah, America's perfect. We don't need to dwell on anything. Uh, that's over. We corrected it. It's okay now. And that that view is exceptional bullshit. The first view is just bullshit. But there's this undeniable fucking feeling underneath it all of the land of the free, all that happy apple pie horse shit. That's, that's there. You feel it. It's, it, again, go listen to I'm Proud to Be an American. It's, it's hard not to be like, yeah, America. <laughs> um, like, I mean, it's, it's very telling that this comes out on the 4th of July and, and people online are debating whether or not the 4th should be fucking celebrated and fuck it. I don't know. Fireworks are cool. Um, So the question Coates raises, can you love the American dream if you know it doesn't apply to everyone equally or indeed most people at all? It's a thinker. It's a head scratcher. Because I think most people... I think most people would, um... Would agree that a lot of the, the ideals of America... They're really pretty on paper. You know, we find these truths to be self-evident that every man is created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, those being to um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, those that's beautiful. It's not true, but it's beautiful. Um... The, the ideal that anyone can come to this nation from anywhere in the world, make a life for themselves, and be an American, not be a foreigner anymore. You can be foreign in America, but you can come to America and you can become an American. Um, and it's not saying that, that neither of those things have ever existed in the nation's history. It's just saying that they're very selective in, in the manner in which they manifest themselves and they're they're selected to certain groups when was the last time you heard about a native american living the american dream building their own success out of nothing it's rare you know you got you got billionaires that grew up in the street um but does that mean that they're a nice exception or are they the the rule it's a thinker i don't know Let's read another cap speech, shall we? Your daddy will get better, I promise. He's in excellent hands, but I need you to keep being brave for him. Not just for him, young man. For me, too. For all of us. For all of us. For your country. Internal monologue. It's a good speech, but still... There are the losses. What speech is there for this mother who's lost her two daughters? What words can explain how our government allowed this? How the killers bear the flag of that government? The same flag as me. Let's 
read something else from the book. Steve talking to Peggy Carter about wanting to get in on a mission that she's involved with. I'd be lying if I say I didn't feel it. The country doesn't trust me anymore. Perhaps even Sh Sharon doesn't. Oh, Sharon Carter, sorry. Perhaps even Sharon doesn't trust me anymore. She knows what was done in my name. If not Hydra, then who? Sharon, people died right in front of me. With all that's coming on in this country, in Washington, I have to help, right? So you want me to turn over intelligence? That is what this is, isn't it? You know I can't do it, Steve. You more than anyone know it's not right. Sharon, these people killed Americans, murdered them right on our own front lawn. Shield is gone, Washington's in chaos. Who is going to see to this? I am, Steve. You think I don't know what you're going through? You think you're the only one living out of time? Blah, 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 exposition. And then a monster impersonated the only man I've ever loved. My God, Steve, he touched me. Listen, I bear the scars of the past all over me, but there's more to me than that. I'm better now, stronger, wiser. Trust me when I say this. I'm not going to find... I am going to find out who did this. And I'm going to make them pay. There's a lot going on in this book. This is really, really interesting. And I think Coates is on to something. That's all I got. It's a good book. You should pick it up. Uh, especially if, like me, you read Spencer's Run and were heavily disappointed by the time it was over. Coates looks like he's going to work on it. And, I mean, Alex Ross is going to be doing the covers. So, you know, if you like beautiful things that are gorgeous and beautiful, you should pick this up. Captain America clutching the American flag and letting it drape on the ground is the most 2018 image I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Just saying. That's not... Alex Ross is a smart-ass uh, artist. That's not him just, oh, this will look cooler... Or this is more natural. No, Alex Ross letting Captain America let the flag drape on the ground. That's saying something. One more time in, <laughs> for the people in the back. That's saying something. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and move on to The Man of Steel, number six. Gotta be honest, this series has been... A roller coaster for me uh it's either been just okay or like i really didn't like that or it's been really really good um it has really gone through the range of emotions for me this issue this issue was really fucking good um wow this issue was great i mean from the opening after the last issue I was really disappointed in the way Bendis was writing John. John Kent uh, is probably my favorite character we've gotten out of Rebirth. Admittedly, we haven't gotten many, but still. Uh, as far as new characters or new voices for a character, John Kent... Wow, he's great. Uh, I love John Kent. Seeing Bendis write him in the last issue, where he's really talking back to his parents a lot, felt very inappropriate, very, very wrong. This issue fixed it and gave you the context uh, in a fantastic way. This sold me on why John was acting that way. 
So we open with... Uh, I'm putting my hand in a very purposeful spot because I don't want you to read it before I reveal. Uh, we open with John being argued about by his parents and his grandfather. Uh, Lois, Clark, and jor are all arguing about what's best for John. We get this uh, line. I'm pretty sure it's from Lois. What? He's fine. Look at him. He's adorable. He has things to work on. Everybody does, but he's fine. John, then why do I grow up to kill millions of people? Wow. Look at the face. Oh, look at the face. Oh. Ooh, wow, that's... Oh, I'm very emotionally vulnerable today. <laughs> Owie. Ooh. So for those that didn't read it, the attempt to save or, or really make a big push on the Super Sons book um, was the Super Sons of Tomorrow story arc, wherein an alternate bad future version of Tim Drake came back in time Terminator style because he wanted to kill John Kent when he was a boy because when John Kent grows up, he becomes Superman, but he can't control the solar flare power and he kills millions of people. Alternate timeline, blah, blah, blah. And, and Clark sits down and tells him as much. John, buddy, I told you. We can't worry about all the different realities and timelines. I told you, it's all just... You have to focus on what is it in here and what you put out there. You worry about you, not the other you or the other other you or the guy who looks like you, but has a big goatee so we know he's really the evil you. Those boys are just other boys, just like Damien is a different boy. And just like you can't be responsible for everything Damien does, you can't be responsible for everything those other boys do too. Be your own self. And you are doing it, buddy. Every day. We're so proud of you. This time of life is so hard for everyone. Human, Martian, Vulcan, whatever Batman really is under there. It's hard growing up. But you have us. And we're going to get th through this and anything else that gets... They rejected me. Who? The Titans. The gold standard of the superhero team dynamic. They said I wasn't good enough. They said come back in a few years. So you will. But they reject me because there's something wrong with me. Just seeing. Oh. Just seeing John break down because he's so afraid of what he could become. And I mean, Manos is, is throwing some shade in the comments. Uh, I remember when I was at the age of my dad had to give me the alternate timeline stock. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, fuck you. <laughs> um, it's comic books, right? This is what we do in superhero comics. There's, yes, it's about alternate timelines and, and bad futures and all this stuff. But you know what? That's the dad talk of like, you're becoming a man and you need to think about who you'll be, the kinds of choices you'll make. And it's just comic bookified. It's like, don't worry about what you might be. Worry about what you're doing and who that's making you. So yeah, this issue is almost entirely focused on um, on why John and Lois are not on Earth, or have not been in Superman's life. And also, we get an explanation for the Red Trunks, <laughs> um, for the return of the Fable Trunks. Um, 
So yeah. Uh, there's also the fight with Rogel Czar continuing. Um, Superman kind of gets under his skin, gets him into space so he can't blow up the Earth, and then uh, we get the moment that kind of closes off the fight as Supergirl shows up and ends the fight for Superman by putting Rogel Czar in the Phantom Zone. Cool. Totally works. Not at all the most interesting thing in this issue. Not even close. Not by a mile. Because the most interesting stuff is all the family stuff with John, Lois, and Jor-El. Uh, and Clark kind of caught in the middle here, not really sure what to do. Um, so John... Uh, John wants to go with Jor-El. Jor-El wants to take John, and John wants to go with him because John is worried about not having a good enough grasp on his powers and what to do. And ultimately, Jor-El kind of breaks down and goes, Fine, both of you can come with two. Ultimately, Lois decides to go because Superman knows he can't. Um, so that's why Lois and, and uh, John have been absent from Man of Steel thus far. And I really like this... I want to read John's dialogue first because, again, I was worried that Bendis didn't know how to write John, or, or at least the way I want to see John written, but we get a little bit of comedic relief here that shows me he does know what he's doing with John. Um, hey, if Damien comes by looking for me, tell him to stay out of my third drawer. In fact, no one should go into my third drawer. In fact, hold on. I uh, have to check on something. <sighs> laser eyes and flames from the bedroom. I took care of the drawer situation. <laughs> uh. that's, that's pretty good. But also we get this conversation between jor and Clark. Speak your mind, son. I think you handled this poorly and now my house is in disarray. Your house was always in disarray. This just proves it. Um, I can raise my boy, father, to do what? Put out fires in his baby clothes? That is not what I do. You were given a chance to do something meaningful here, Cal. I moved the heavens to save you. You sent me to Earth. This is Earth. But is it all it can be? Are you doing all you can for it, my son? I know you do so much for these people. You are a beacon of hope. But this, this is just the beginning of what you are capable of. Both you and your son. I know it as deeply as I know anything. The House of El has survived for a reason. You must feel that too. So there's a lot of debate that has been had in the Superman fandom about how important Jor-El is to the mythos. Uh, on the one side, you have Jor-El is one of the most important characters in the Superman uh, mythos, and what he did by sending Clark to Earth is a really, really big deal, and it was done for a reason well thought out and should be explored heavily. On the other end, you have the fact that jor was created as an excuse to give Superman his powers, and sending him to Earth is the only thing of significance the character has done, or will ever do, and we should stop telling stories about jor from that point on. I generally like to fall somewhere in the middle of that! <laughs> um, I think you can tell interesting jor stories, but I don't think he should be the focus of the goddamn series. Uh, you know, Smallville, 
did way too much Jor-El. Uh, what, what's done with him in the first two Superman movies I feel is fairly appropriate. Um, the idea that Jor-El sent Superman to Earth for a reason other than you can survive there is something that gets really interesting and I always pick around the edges of and I really try to think of like how I feel about that. And as long as the writer has a vision for what they're doing, I really can't say that I hate the idea. How much of a vision Bendis has, I've yet to know, but while this series has been on the rocks a little bit, it's had its moments where I really haven't liked it. This issue is pretty damn good, and it's it's got me thinking that he really does have a direction, a voice for where he wants to take Superman. And he's, very importantly, he's got a voice for the character. He's got a voice for Superman. Um, Superman's interactions with Rolgelzar are really good. You'll be dead soon, Kryptonian. Maybe the answers await you in the next life. Where are you from? I had to research what Superman means in Earth language. You really have them fooled. You know, it's the sincerity that gets me. I'm sorry. You're very sincere in your hatred for me just because you because of who you think I am. That's sincerity. I feel really sad for you. That's really good Superman writing. Mm, that's a really strong voice for Superman. That's such a Superman. Ah, it's so Superman. Oh, Christ, that's good. Bendis knows what he's doing, I think. He, he worries me from time to time. As long as he can make it pay off, I'll, I'll trust him. He's really got me hooked in this. Um, might as well announce it here. Geeky Gentleman um, special episode will be posted probably next week on the six issue series. So look forward to that. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Everyone doing good in the comments? <laughs> oh. Alright. Looks good to me. Uh, Shadow of Batman's asking who's going to be on that Geeky Gentleman episode. Um, I'm getting Alfie. Uh, it's not recorded yet, but Alfie and I are going to do it. So we're planning to record it and hopefully get it out for you by next week. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> Having a hard time breathing. Hmm. All right, let's go ahead and go on. Talk about Doctor Strange, number three. Mark Wade continues to kill it in his Doctor Strange run. Uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. This is a lot of fun. Uh, so, Doctor Strange is, is going across the galaxy uh, looking for magical artifacts and the ability to use magics kind of returned to him, uh, though nowhere near as strong as it once was. Uh, he's got this companion who kind of just hawks magical objects across the galaxy. And you get the, the sense that she and, and he are in a mismatched pair. I really like this scene. That's the world heart talisman. You can't sell it. Is it made of rocket fuel? It is not. So unless you want to spend the rest of your life on a planet where they breathe ammonia, let it go. <laughs> The idea that there's just like a it's just stuff connected to magical objects of the which of course hold a value all their own there is power in the objects when when you talk about magical items 
I like it. It's it's a fun dynamic. Um, so you're going across the galaxy. Uh, she's pl promised to take him to a master sorcerer um, who will be able to teach him some new stuff. Uh, help him in his quest to regain all of his magical abilities. Turns out it's a planet of scrolls. It's a scroll wizard. There's a scroll wizard. That's great. I love it. Look at this. Oh, it's so cool. Ah, I love it. And I love the way Wade's writing about it. It's so cool. His techniques are fascinating. I'd never thought to emulate a multi-limb stance to combine enhancements, performing the flatline and the serum at once. Hmm. That's really cool. And and of course, like Strange has uh, being on a scroll planet. Strange has all these musings about what that would be like and I, I really think it's just Wade having fun which is great to read um what he wondered was the nature of a race of shapeshifters how did they define identity did they even bother to he tried to remember if he had ever encountered a scroll who was especially distinct he could think of only one and even that one had never faced the magician directly in this new scroll civilization, there was no houses. If scrolls felt a need to protect themselves from the elements, presumably they could simply transform themselves. There were no vehicles. What use would they be to a race of capable of running like a cheetah or flying like a bird? Any attempt at visual homogeny was almost certainly a function of fellowship, not a forced containment, containment in some unchosen birth form. The scrolls who periodically at attacked Earth chose humanoid shapes theorized to whatever. It's just, it's just musings. It's just interesting. Like, yeah, what the fuck would a race of shapeshifters be? I don't know. So yeah, you get in this great blend of magic and sci-fi, and ah, oh, just such a perfect way that totally only works in a comic book universe. Um. Anyway. Because uh, Infinity War came out and made all the money in the world, Marvel wants more of it, so they're tying in their comics with a big event. This is the kind of event where I'm fine the way that it's tying in because it's not distracting from the actual story. Uh, the Skrulls have the time gem and... Strange gets in a fight with the Super Scroll, uh, and yeah, you know, the Super Scroll that's got all the powers of the Fantastic Four, uh, and has to use the Time Gem against him, Time Stone, whatever. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. Because he he uses it to create an army of himself to attack the Super Scroll all at once. It's awesome. Uh, they immediately leave the planet after that with the Time Stone um, in order to get his companion's help to try and steal the Time Stone. He had promised to give it to her without any condition. Uh, he lied. Um... I made that promise only for one reason, to get your help. There was too much at stake. I had no choice. You son of a... I trusted you. I know. And I'm sorry. And then he used this palm of forgetfulness on her. I... What were we talking about? What's in the glowy case? Ratchet wand. Where to next? The Arbitrion Nebula? The Rings of Sorana? Up to you. I trust you. Sad face, fly off into space, continue the adventure. Magic comes at a cost. The magician no longer care. Cared, or so he told himself. Um, so yeah, three issues in. Pretty strong arc. Uh, just 
gives you the sense of where this book's going and what you're going to be doing. It's just Doctor Strange gallivanting around in space, dealing with different threats. This was a tie-in issue. Didn't feel like a departure or distraction at all. That's great. Wade knows what he's doing. He's got the experience to write in comic books. That's all it comes down to. You're just reading an experienced writer. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. That's all I got for that one. So many books today, y'all. So many books! Not enough time. Final issue of the week is Cosmic Ghost Rider number one. This is something I had to get just for the cover and the the craziness of the premise. Um, apparently, it was a thing established in the Thanos ongoing. Whatever. Uh, I like the, the, the way that this works. So, yeah. Cosmic Ghost Rider is, in fact, Frank Castle. <laughs> um, and... You know, Marvel usually does their whole catch-up page thing, and they did here. It's really not needed because we get two pages right at the beginning that kind of just explain everything that that Frank Castle's been through. Soldier, Dead Family, War on Terror, Death, Hell, Spirit of Vengeance, Madness, Devourer. So yeah, that's, that was his character arc. That's what Frank Castle's life was like. And, and Afterlife. Uh, and then we get a third page. Cosmic Power. Thanos. Death. Death. So I really want to read Thanos. Because this looks super fucking nuts. Uh, but yeah. Frank Castle became the Cosmic Ghost Rider. And became Thanos' black hand of death. Black right hand. Something something. But now... As a reward for dying valiantly, uh, I'm assuming fighting against Thor or something, or Thanos maybe, uh, Frank Castle is in Valhalla, uh, beating the shit out of the Norse gods. Um, that all you have, mortal? Who taught you to fight, eh? Thanos, the devil. In the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. Oh my, that's a lot of fun. So Odin's pretty pissed that uh, Frank Castle's being such a dick in Valhalla. And decides, you know what? In fact, your willful absistency reminds me of an old Midgard saying I am fond of. I believe it is Fuck you and the horse you rode in on. So he's gonna just give him the Ghost Rider cycle back and send him back in time or what the fuck ever to go be Cosmic Ghost Rider because he doesn't want to deal with his bullshit. Because <laughs> Punisher's such an asshole. <laughs> oh my god, I love this shit. Uh, but as Frank's... Looking at the Ghost Rider helm, he's like, no, I can, I've been down that road, I ain't going. All of a sudden, Odin uses his magic to just turn him back into the Cosmic Ghost Rider. I wasn't offering a choice. And so, yeah, now he's, he's Cosmic Ghost Rider again. Uh, and Odin's like, alright, where do you want to go? Because I'm getting you the fuck out of here. And Cosmic Ghost Rider decides that he's going to go kill Thanos when he was a baby. But it doesn't work. Because Thanos is a bastard already, but he's also innocent and cannot be so easily dispatched. And so, Cosmic Ghost Rider punches a baby, <laughs> baby Thanos, <laughs> ties him up with chains, and they're off together. Fuck it. Only one way to find out. Uh, Philip Kelton says, so Cosmic Ghost Rider is a comedic comic? I mean, it's more of like just, it's so fucking over the top, it kind of has to just acknowledge the absurdness of it, but it's still giving you a lot of really kick-ass fucking shit. Like, again... Ah! 
I mean, that's the cover for next issue. <laughs> it's knuckin' futz, man. It's just knuckin' futz. Oh. Uh, this isn't my first time giving Thanos the penance stare. Not by a long shot. Back when I was King Thanos' black right hand, he used to make me give him his penance every morning. Make me inflict all the pain and misery he had dished out on the universe right back into his evil soul. He loved every minute of it. Yeah, I mean, it's just the, the tone of it. Um, again, this is something that could, could and, and by all rights, should be absolute trash. Uh, but it's written by Donnie Cates, who has a lot of history in the comic book industry, if, if I'm remembering correctly. And so he knows what he's doing. He knows how to write this, but make it fun. And he knows to just, okay, let Dylan Burnett, the artist, just do his thing, draw a lot of cool shit... I'm not going to get too deep into the lore and making this like a super sympathetic thing. I'm just, here's the reason that Ghost or that uh, Frank Castle is choosing to leave Valhalla. Um, when I was doing what it, I did back on Earth, only way I made it, ever made it right was, was by telling myself that my turn would come, my turn to be punished. Only my turn never did came, did it? No, I sold my soul to the worst devil ever lived and still got another chance. I rode with Thanos and I get a noble death. I get a reward. Well, 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 my family's still dead and no one ever ripped time apart to give them nothing. Ask me again why I, why I, why I spit in your face. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's just, yeah, that, that's the pathos you get, and that's pretty dead on with Punisher. It's a suicide mission. He's just waiting to get his punishment back because he blames himself for his family's death, and, and honestly, he's responsible for it. Um, and so, yeah, he's just not happy with Paradise, Valhalla. And so he's going to just go on being miserable, being the cosmic ghost rider with baby Thanos. Yeah. I'm there for this. I am pretty there for that. I don't know how much of this I'm going to read, but it's damn tempting. I'll tell you that much. All right. I think that's it. Woo! What a week, folks. What a week. Oh, man. So many books. So, so very many books. Alrighty. One thing to go. Gotta do my episode of Trade Talk. So, see you live comments. See you in another live comment session. <laughs> oh, before I start Trade Talk, let me just say real quick. Uh, if you have not voted for the next episode of the Comic Book Club, you kind of need to before Saturday, because as of right now, the episode's still live, or the, the voting's still, still available, it's still time to vote, but the results are tied. <laughs> And I'll think of something to do in the event of a tie. But I just... I don't really want to have to. I would like a more definitive result. If in you please. So, people go vote. Go vote for the next episode of Comic Book Club if you haven't already. Alright. Let's go ahead and go on to Trade Talk. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trade Talk. I'm continuing trying to stay away from DC for a bit, explore some Marvel stuff, and I have here Wolverine Origin. Um, this is a series that came out almost 10 years ago now, 
um, and more than 10 years ago, almost 20 years ago, shit, it came out in the early 2000s, um, and it's about Wolverine's origin, if you can imagine that. Let's see, when is this? Got a, uh, note in here from 2002. Um, so, yeah, the, the premise here is how did Logan become Wolverine, uh, to begin with? Not, not the Weapon X stuff. Where was he born? What was his origin? And so, if you saw the movie X-Men Origins Wolverine, a lot of people will talk about how the best part of that movie is the opening credits. And there are really good opening credits. We don't even get to that point here. So, Weapon X is a far-off hope. Wolverine going to war, not even close. We get the opening credits, the scene before the opening credits, basically. Uh, without the brotherly connection to Sabretooth, or so it would seem. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, I don't know. But yeah. So, Lo uh, James is born a sickly child. Uh, James Howlett is born a sickly child who can't even go outside most of the time because of how bad his allergies are, and whose mother uh, stays locked up in a room almost year-round. Um, and the, the estates of Canada, I guess. Um, until one night when tragedy strikes and the groundskeeper, a man named Logan comes into the house and attempts to kidnap the wife who it's heavily implied he had an affair with um and you know ends up sh killing people logan dies uh the mother kills herself uh when james howlett loses control of himself and attacks the groundskeeper releasing his mutant abilities for the first time rose a girl who is charged with you know, basically a nanny for james uh ends up running away with him they get out of the uh out of town Across the country and James and her begin working at a uh, rock quarry in the far north of Canada. Uh, James doesn't take to it at first but eventually learns to accept this new life and becomes more feral as time goes on spending years at this rock quarry uh, becoming quite a proficient hunter and such grows into a man uh forms a rivalry with one of the guys and becomes more and more animalistic over time until one day when tragedy strikes and the son of the groundskeeper back in the Hallett estate tracks them down and goes to uh basically get his revenge on Wolverine. Uh, also, Rose has fallen in love with a guy named Smitty, who is the boss of the mine, of the quarry. So Logan and Smitty have a bit of a rivalry because they both love Rose, but Rose doesn't love Logan. Or, L Rose doesn't love James, let me put it that way. Uh, but... It's all kind of moot because the son of the groundskeeper, nicknamed Dog, who I think it's supposed to be Sabretooth, but he doesn't seem to have any powers, so I'm going to say it's not, uh, attacks, ends up killing Rose, um, and running off without getting killed himself. Um, after Rose's death, Logan 
since he's the one that accidentally stabbed her in his attempts to kill uh, the the son of the groundskeeper. Uh, Logan retreats into the amount, mountains into isolation, becoming more of an animal, uh, while Smitty is left to suffer alone. And Rose's diary, chronicling all these events, is burned in the end by a thief. That's the basic premise of the story. You know, it's interesting. I liked it to a degree. There's definitely a lot of character development and growth here, and you can kind of see the man that Logan would become. Um, I like the idea of why he is such an animal being played with here. I just think that this is like, you could have done that in three issues and then spend the rest of the time on like the wars or something, I don't know. Uh, it's not the kind of Wolverine origin I really wanted, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but there's just so much time spent on stuff that's, while engaging, doesn't really seem to matter all that much to who he becomes. Um, the amount of time he spends as James Howlett, I don't know, it's interesting that he's so not what you would expect from young Wolverine, but then he just kind of becomes that, basically in a page turn, or at between one issue and the next. I don't know, I just, I was... It's not bad. I was just less than impressed, less than blown away. Uh, it seemed like they had an interesting premise, and then they just spent too much time meandering around in one thing. Uh, I don't know. All this stuff with the rock quarry takes up so much the issue, and I'm just or so much the book. I'm just like, I mean, it's interesting, but it's not that interesting. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what I was really hoping for, though. Maybe more time of just Logan being in the wilderness. I don't I don't really know what I expected. Cause I like that stuff and they do a pretty compelling reason for why he he kind of self exiled and became an animal. But it just didn't it didn't hit me in any big way. It's all I got, really. I'm sorry. It's like it's the shortest episode of Trade Talk ever, I guess. I don't not have anything else to really say about this. Wolverine isn't really Wolverine by the end of this. He's the character that just kind of, you know, stalks around the woods. None of these other characters really matter that much, except that maybe the guy is Sabretooth. Um, it's really vague. On, on some of these details, and honestly, I don't know what they were thinking. It's, it's, it's certainly not bad, but it's just not at all what I'd hoped it'd be. And I really don't know what I was hoping for. I was, I was figuring it was going to be more like the Origins movie, except, you know, not suck. Uh, where we're going to get, like, the early days of it, and, you know, for maybe the first issue... Then get maybe some of the war stuff, because I thought that was an interesting idea, and then maybe we get some Weapon X, or the introduction to Weapon X. It's less than impressive, certainly. Um, I don't know. I got nothing. I'm not going to keep sitting here trying to come up with stuff, so that'll do it for Trade Talk. Uh, yeah, see ya. Bye. <laughs> How people do it in the live comments. Uh, Wolverine origin comic or the movie? Obviously the comic. Mm. La 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 la. Mm. Imagine that. Blah blah blah. Do a coin toss to break the tie on comic book club. Oh, possibly.
Uh, I actually do have a replica of Two Faces coin somewhere, Philip Kelton. I read this Wolverine Origins so long ago. If there's one good thing about X Men Origins, Wolverine did well. It was the video game better than. Um, but other than that, they reprinted this and Weapon X. Uh, hmm. Paddle to the death to break the tie. Oh. Uh, Next week, am I going to do Weapon X? Nope, I don't have Weapon X. I asked for good standalone Marvel stuff on Twitter, and someone told me to get Wolverine Origin. I'm like, okay. And it's definitely standalone, so I just can't complain on that front. Um, hmm. Well, not a lot of activity in the comments, so... I think that's going to do it for this episode of Comic Reviews. Thanks, everyone, for taking time out of your day to come watch. Hope you enjoyed my mountain of comics. Hope you go enjoy some comics and some fireworks today yourself. All right. Till next time, everyone. Bye.